Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this African European webinar on climate, rainforest, and indigenous people in sub Saharan Africa. My name is Umi Erika Viedia. I am the head of the Climate and Environment Committee of the Norwegian Council of Africa, where we work on challenging the political and economic structures and mechanisms hindering a just development in Africa. And we also work on raising awareness, disseminating knowledge, and influencing relevant actors and stakeholders. Today, we are highlighting connections between climate, rainforest, and indigenous people from two broad dimensions. One on the importance and role of rainforest and indigenous people in climate change mitigation, globally, nationally, and locally. And one on the importance of the rainforest for food security and sustainable livelihoods to the indigenous people and local communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is an international webinar where we have brought together state actors, academia, civil society organization and members from the African and European continent, where we want to lift different voices, stories and experiences from the ground, including recommendations on the way forward. Before we introduce you to our five guest speakers today, we will give you some insight into the setting and background of today's theme and dialogue. The setting is in sub-Saharan Africa, which is home to more than 1.1 billion people, and is also home to the second largest rainforest on Earth, namely the Congo Basin rainforest. Congo Basin extends across six countries in Central Africa, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. And Congo Basin benefits all of us by being, among other things, a source of water and a source of food, and plays a critical role for the health of the planet and the health of the people. But unfortunately, the Congo Basin is a green treasure that is also under threat, where the indigenous people and local communities are under increasing pressure from many different angles, such as climate change and extreme weather condition, strong commercial drivers of land degradation and deforestation, which again is a driver of climate change through emission of greenhouse gas gases and reduced rates of carbon uptake by the forest. And although the issues of deforestation and forest degradation have gained increased attention globally in climate conferences, and most recently in the climate conference in Glasgow, the indigenous people and local communities continues to be left out of the most of the large political arenas and decision making processes. But also fortunately, we do also observe an increasing awareness and understanding of the importance and value of the rainforest in climate change mitigation and how the indigenous people and local communities must be heard and included as active partners and agents of change resolutions. And this perspective and knowledge has emerged on the agenda due to research and advocacy by academia, state and non-state actors. And among those actors, we find the five guest speakers we have here today. Uh, so we will give a short introduction to the guest speakers, but you can read the full bio in the chat box before each of the guest speakers presentation. We are happy to have uh, Life Young Foster here today, who is a senior advisor at the Norwegian International Climate and Forest Initiative, housed in the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Oslo. He's a social anthrop uh, anthropologist by training and has previously worked in World Wealth Foundation on community-based conservation in Southern Africa and Southeast Asia. Then we have Felana Rakotovo, who is the Indigenous People Program Coordinator for Rainforest Foundation Norway in their office in Democratic Republic of Congo. She holds two master's degrees, one in local development and project management, and one in economy and management of the environment and environmental impacts. Her passion is to support local communities and indigenous people for the governance and management of their natural resources to sustain their, their well-being. Next, we have Marian Wallet Abubakrin, who is a core member of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food System and a former chair of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and also an advisory body to the Economic and Social Council, which is at the heart of the United Nations system to advance the three dimensions of sustainable development. And next we have Edmond Dunias, who is uh, also a core member of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food System. He is an ethnobiologist at the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development and is also a senior research associate to the Center for International Forestry Research. And by using his field work experience in the rainforest of Congo Basin, Sumatra and Borneo, he explored the resilience of the food system of present day hunter gatherers to global change. And last we have Ellen Henrique Olerud, who is a senior advisor at NORAD, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, 
in the Department for Climate, Energy and Environment. She's a natural resource economist by training and has a 10 years experience working with Red Plus in Africa, Latin America and Norway. And the moderators of the event uh, are me, is me, Umi Erika and Emmanuel Manioli Mulua, who is also a core member of the Climate and Environment Committee of the Norwegian Council of Africa, and is going to lead the panel discussion later today. Some very short practical information. Uh, in the first part of the webinar, each actor will have a maximum 10 minute PowerPoint presentation. And in the second part of the webinar, there will be a panel dialogue. And then in the last part of the webinar, there will be time for questions from the audience. And we highly encourage and welcome everyone to communicate with us and each other in the chat box uh, or use uh, the Q&A to ask questions and also prov uh, provide us with uh, recommendations, uh, comments and inputs. All questions are welcome, but we cannot guarantee that the guest speakers have answers for all aspects of them. But if you prefer to ask questions anonymously, you can send these questions to me or Emmanuel directly as a private message in the chat box, and we will bring the questions up when it's time for the Q&A session. So now I welcome the first guest speakers, finally, <laughs> Leif Jon Foster, who is the Senior Advisor for Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. Uh, the contribution and the responsibility and focus for his uh, presentation will be the role of indigenous people and local communities as guardians of tropical forests and associated ecosystems. So welcome, uh, Leif Jun. I will leave the screen to you. Thank you so much and good afternoon to all. And now comes, comes the exciting moment where I don't see exactly what you see. So please tell me if you see something looking like the first page of a presentation. I don't see it yet. Um, no, if you okay. I just see you. <laughs> okay. How about now? now? Now I see it. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good. Right. So thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Lefjan Fosse. I'm with the Ministry of Climate and Environment, uh, part of a special initiative. Uh, which was set up back in 2008, uh, where Prime Minister Stoltenberg uh, promised that Norway uh, would spend up to 3 billion NOx a year uh, for supporting tropical forest conservation and sustainable development in countries committed to uh, reducing deforestation. Um, this we do in terms of bilateral cooperation with governments uh, that are committed to reducing deforestation. We support uh, their efforts by uh, funding and uh, uh, setting up multilateral programs which can assist them, such as the World Bank and the UN Red program. And importantly, we also fund civil society to, in order to provide alternative expertise to that sort of expertise which governments have themselves or the UN or the World Bank has. And another function of uh, civil society is also to hold governments and private sector to account. And in all of this uh, effort, and you see the seven strategies that we use on the screen now, in all of this effort, we are supported by special climate and forest envoys at the embassies in the tropical forest countries and NORAD, which you will hear from later by Ellen. So when you look at these seven strategies of working, you will see in the left or upper side, we focus on what we do to incentivize and to support tropical forest countries to help address the governance failures, which we find is the, one of the driving uh, reasons behind persistently high rates of deforestation in the tropical forest countries. And now what is a governance failure? That is the situation where good goals, targets and policies, which most countries do have, do not automatically translate into effective action on the ground on account um, of corruption, lack of capacity and a host of other factors. Now, if you look at the right or right bottom side, that's strategy five, six, seven. Um, that 
Those uh, revolve around demand side measures. That means helping to address the market failure, which is also driving deforestation. And the market failure, again, that is the unfortunate situation that forests are more worth dead than alive. That means that they are more worth in terms of conversion to agriculture, mining or timber plantation. All of that, all of those uses of forest or the conversions of forest for those uses is seen as more lucrative in the short term than standing forest. And that's of course, because the ecosystem services that forests provide to the climate, to people, to indigenous peoples uh, living in them does not have monetary value. So where do indigenous peoples and local communities fit into this picture? Uh, from the beginning, in line with many other actors in the area of climate and forests, uh, we probably viewed them as stakeholders so we, to which we wanted to do no harm. But they have grown in importance as a strategy in themselves, as a key strategy for the climate initiative. And this has to do with how we have learned that that indigenous peoples and local communities are indeed key guardians of tropical forests, or indeed most remaining intact ecosystems, which we depend on for our livelihoods, economy and ecosystem services, as well as the opportunity to stay within one and a half degrees of climate change. Something which you might have heard from the Glasgow COP. Okay, so let's on, move on to the science background of uh, why uh, this shift and attention to indigenous peoples has taken place. Uh, and that is related to um, the fact that in, in recent years, we have seen increasing scientific evidence, as well as recognition from both the International Panel on Climate Change and the uh, equivalent panel for the uh, for the biodiversity convention that indigenous peoples and local communities protect biodiversity and forest carbon more effectively than other forms of management. This evidence has most often most often been drawn from Latin America, where it is uh, much more clear cut uh, than in Africa and Asia, who are indigenous peoples and were also where their land rights tend to be recognized to a greater extent. Now, in a recent study from where this illustration is drawn, uh, published in the journal Nature Sustainability, uh, researchers have found this, this tendency that indigenous peoples and local communities protect uh, nature more effectively than state managed, state managed protected areas. They find that this actually applies also in Africa and Asia. They find that indigenous territories have significantly lower rates of deforestation and forest degradation than protected areas. This in spite of receiving much less funding. So whereas strictly protected areas and indigenous territories are found to be equally effective, more or less in Asia and Latin America, indigenous territories and communally held land are found to be more effective in Africa. So that is a uh, interesting focus for today's discussion, I suppose, that in the continent where this has been tried out to the least extent, that is perhaps where there would be most to most to gain by uh, securing the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities to the areas that they live in to protect them more effectively. And this is because strictly protected areas in Africa actually have higher deforestation, rate, deforestation rates than non-protected areas. I mean, most of the, each of the continents are non-protected and uh, you will see from this map uh, what those areas are. Um, the, the green is the uh, tropical forests, um, the, the rainforest or, and other tropical forests. And then uh, you will see protected areas, state protected areas, indigenous lands and uh, lands which are both protected by the state and indigenous peoples. So um, this conf level of conflict that has resulted from protected areas not being as effective as they should be in Africa. That is a result of conflict with local population, 
which probably, uh, or one of the reasons that has been promoted uh, as an answer to this, is related to the outdated, perhaps even colonial nation, notion that to protect nature effectively, there can be no humans there. And that, that sort of idea is uh, increasingly coming under criticism. Now, indigenous peoples and local communities themselves, on the other hand, they hold that their traditional knowledge and light touch livelihoods and extensive use of large tracts of land, that's the key to understand why they protect uh, nature more effectively. Sorry about the rustling of papers here. And that is also why they find, and in, now that science also doc documents, that these territories actually hold more biodiversity and more carbon than other areas. So what we are talking about here is really communal land management as an alternative to state mismanagement, where that is the where that where that occurs, and elite capture. And more effective protection against future pandemics, because that's also something we've learned that uh, when we get too far into the rainforest and disturb ecosystems too much, uh, that will uh, retaliate on us. So um, another way to look about look at this is to look at, you know, what are the kind of areas uh, which we cannot afford to lose? Which areas should where should we concentrate our efforts and uh, you can see that you know here are four examples uh, the northwestern forests of canada and the united states that's not our key concern here today uh, but uh, certainly the deep peatlands of the amazon river in peru ecuador and brazil that's incredibly important in terms of the kind of biodiversity found there and the tropical forest carbon found there. Same applies for the peatlands in the uh, Congo Basin forest, holds a lot of carbon and also a lot of biodiversity. And similar for the peatlands in Borneo and other places in Indonesia. So that these places hold the, 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 a study by the Conservation International, one of the large international conservation organizations, uh, has researched this and has found that, you know, if we are to stand any chance of staying within safe limits of climate change, uh, we have to uh, protect some core ecosystems such as these. Uh, and we cannot rely on being able to restore nature because if we lose these kind of ecosystems, we lose, so, we release so much carbon into the air that whatever we do, uh, you know, it will be too late to stay within safe limits. So these are high pr priority uh, ecosystems uh, in that way, because they cannot be restored, restored by 2050, which is the time when uh, we have to be down to basically zero emissions. And if you look more closely at these areas, you will see that 20, more than 20% of these are within protected areas, legally declared and managed by governments. So well, that's good that they, they actually cover some of the areas. But an even higher proportion, 34% is within indigenous lands and community lands. And three quarters of the priority areas is found in just 7% of the Earth's land area, such as peatlands, mangroves, and old growth forests, typically managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. So indigenous peoples and local communities clearly play a critical role in global climate security. So um, in closing, let's just look at what are some of the things that happened at um, COP26 where uh, world leaders uh, entered into several uh, commitments, uh, including a forest pledge, a pledge to conserve tropical forests backed by $12 billion of, of uh, commitments and uh, another 7 billion US dollars uh, by private philanthropies and private sector interests. Uh, there was a special pledge for indigenous peoples and local communities uh, at $1.7 billion. 
there was a 1.5 billion pledge for Central African forests. And what's running through all of these commitments is the key role of indigenous peoples and local communities. So with that, I have probably exceeded my limit and I shall try to stop there unless there are any uh, questions or clarifications, but I suppose we have to move on the, in the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Life Jon Foster. Uh, it was a very interesting and important uh, presentation for also the conversation of the rest of this webinar. And thank you for mentioning uh, the Glasgow Conference and um, the pledge and commitments that were made by the world leaders there. And this is also something we want to discuss a little bit uh, after. Uh, what does this mean, uh, these commitments, uh, as they're not necessarily binding commitments. So how do they make these commitments into meaningful actions? Uh, but we will go to the next um, guest speaker now, uh, Felana Rokotovo, the program coordinator of Rainforest Foundation Norway. Uh, the first theme that she will <clears throat> tackle is the climate justice for indigenous people in the Congo Basin. So I welcome you, Felana, uh, and uh, your screen, your presentation will be shared. Welcome. Okay, hello Erika. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Felana Hakutubo. I am the Indigenous People Program Coordinator at Rainforest uh, Foundation Norway here in our office in DRC. Uh, Rainforest Foundation Norway is uh, an international organization that um, works to protect uh, the contiguous rainforest in the world uh, with a right based um, approach. So today I will present um, the, the presentation today is about the impact of climate change, deforestation and land degradation on indigenous people. And I will take the case of TRC in the Congo Basin. Next, please. <clears throat> so first, I would like to give some general context of uh, DRC currently. Um, as you see, uh, DRC is among, uh, if we talk about environmental situation, uh, DRC is among the 10 mega diverse countries uh, in the world, uh, but with worrisome loss of uh, biodiversity currently. Um, it is the second, it is part of the Congo Basin, which hosts the second largest rainforest in the world. Uh, for DRC uh, specifically, it is uh, about 155 million hectares. And also there, there are challenges because uh, there are great, uh, great anthropic pressures, um, specifically from industrial concession, whether it is forest concession or agriculture concession. Um, when we talk about uh, the current situa political situation, uh, there is some windows of opportunities and uh, uh, regarding, for example, the protection of uh, rainforests, as it is a political one of the political priority uh, for this government. Uh, but there are still uh, instability and insecurity in the countries, especially in the east of DRC. Uh, as you may know, maybe that the population is large and uh, young, but with uh, the social um, situation is uh, services is uh, very inadequate. Next, please. So when we talk when we talk about indigenous people. Uh, in DRC, we talk mainly about pygmy indigenous people. Um, they are uh, considered at the first, as the first inhabitant of uh, DRC. They are considered largely as the first inhabitant of DRC. And they are estimated uh, to 600,000 up to 3 million uh, now, uh, present in the 21 provinces out of the 26 that, um, of the territories. 
uh, their lifestyle uh, are very dependent on forest and natural resources. And uh, as Liv said in his uh, presentation, mainly their territories are, overla are overlapping with the intact forests where we can find high biodiversity um, conservation and high stock of carbon. They are called, uh, in the national language, they are uh, mostly called batwa or bambuti. Uh, and uh, as I've said before, they are part of the um, population that is also, uh, that has an economic, a really uh, worrisome economic uncertainty. Next, please. So how does the uh, climate change or deforestation uh, impact um, the indigenous, those pygmy indigenous people? Uh, it is, if we know that um, the population in Congo is, uh, has the, this challenge, economical challenge, this is uh, the pygmy indigenous people are more vulnerable to this as I have uh, said before. And the climate change and deforestation are exacerbating this, um, this economical poverty. Um, first of all, um, they are very overrepresented in the poorest layer of the Congolese society. Um, their traditional activities because of deforestation and uh, climate change no longer allow them to ensure the livelihood while they have they have no other sources of income or any training or skill. So sometimes, for example, in the Equator province, there are some Batwa people who used to live in forest, but then migrate to the city of Bandaka, which is the city, uh, the largest city of the Equator province. Uh, as I said, because of deforestation and loss of biodiversity on their tradi traditional space. But once in the city, they are exploited and used as manual labor uh, that are sometimes even degrading because they don't have the skills, as I've said, to expect something better. And they don't adapt well to the reality of the city of Bandaka. They are just in some survival mode. Another great impact of climate change and deforestation is their, on their um, lifestyle and identity. We know, as said before, that they have a complex relationship with their environment and the change in uh, precipitation patterns, patterns or seasonal cycle disrupt their, uh, their, their agricultural calendar or harvests and affected also the wild, fr the wild fruits and uh, have a serious safety implication on the health and their health and cultural identity. Uh, the livelihoods, uh, and uh, if I may say worse than that, the livelihoods and cultures of indigenous people are also threatened by the measures for climate and biodiversity mitigation and adaptation measures. As a concrete example, the erection of uh, national park, for example, in the east of uh, DRC, there is a park called uh, Kauzi Biega National Park, um, that has left three generations of Batwa people wandering around the protected area because they were expelled uh, during the creation of the park. And they have to wander on other communities' land, just uh, exacerbating inter-community conflicts and also leading to the loss of their traditional knowledge and practices uh, within a generation because they they don't have um, they they don't have the land where they can transmit uh, this uh, knowledge and practices which maintain the forest as it is. Uh, also, another big impact is uh, gender inequalities. Uh, as we know, indigenous people and and girls, indigenous girls, play a vital role in traditional and non-traditional livelihoods. Um, in care and food security for the family. But when they are faced with the increase in economic insecurity because of deforestation, because of climate change, they have to um, quit their villages, for example, when resource becomes scarce. And they are looking for informal, uh, the work for 
They look for work in the informal economy, uh, for example, as agricultural workers in the countryside or as domestic workers in urban areas. Thus, can expose them to uh, domestic and sexual violence. Um, also, climate change is uh, a major contributor uh, to their um, to increase their daily workload and exposure, as I said, to violence. For an example, in the Maindombe province, uh, which is near Kinshasa, indigenous women are getting their water in a lake called the Maindombe Lake. But these days, water scarcity of the lake requires for them to travel long distance to search for water, which not, not only greatly complicates their daily tasks, but still puts them at risk of sexual assault when they are away from the village. Uh, also, uh, when we talk about uh, gender inequality, uh, those women say that uh, they are using medicinal plants in order to ease their pain during child, childbirth, for example. But nowadays, these plants are also scarce and put, just put their health in great danger. Next, please. So our work in DRC to address some of the impacts that I have uh, just communicated, uh, we work in uh, four uh, pillars, if I may say. We are working uh, with initiatives uh, to experiment and to uh, promote right-based forest management. Uh, we talk about CFCL um, as uh, we want to promote the CFCL as uh, this right-based management because uh, CFCL is um, local community forest concession. Um, uh, we want also to um, push for other means of conservation that recognize the rights of indigenous people on their lands and on their forests and on their natural resources. Um, so this is a work that we do in the field, if I may say. Another work is at uh, politi poli policy and legal framework uh, level, which we do at national and international level. And on this, we are working, for example, on uh, a law that uh, protects and promotes indigenous people's law. The law has been passed this year at the National Assembly. It is still at the Senate level, but we hope that it will pass also this year or next year. Uh, we work, we want to also influence uh, the reforms um, uh, that uh, is currently, uh, the, uh, that is currently, um, uh, that we are, uh, DRC is currently doing. Uh, there is uh, four great reforms uh, that we want to influence, land use planning, land tenure, um, agriculture, and um, um, and forest, forest to, for the protection and promotion of uh, indigenous people's rights in those reform. Um, another uh, area of our work to address, to address um, the, to promote the rights of indigenous people is the monitoring and halting of rights violation and protection of intact forests. As we know, uh, as I've said before, intact forests are part, uh, are most overlapping with uh, indigenous people's territories and local local communities' territories. And um, last, uh, capacity building. So those are done with local partners that we have at national and provincial and local levels. And we have also big alliances with other organization, international organization like us. And we target and collaborate with donors, for example, the CAFI Fund and the government and other uh, state institution. So our uh, work is to, uh, in, uh, to, to summarize, our work is to amplify civil society and IP organizational voices, advocacy and initiative to promote and to protect pygmies and indigenous people's rights uh, on their land and uh, their identity for their sustainable development. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Felana, for a very informative uh, presentation and sharing different examples, among other things, on the effects of climate change on indigenous people's livelihoods and how it affects their food security and also um, makes them displaced and they have to migrate from their the land because of incorrect use of land. So it's overall a human rights issue. So thank you very much. And we will um, discuss further in the, um, the panel dialogue. Our next uh, guest speaker of today is uh, Dr. Mariam Vallet Abubakrin, uh, who is a core member of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food System and a co-principal investigator of a global, a global research project called Aramat. Uh, she's not here today with us, but has made a video presentation for us, uh, introducing the Global Hub on Indigenous Food System and the concept of Aramat, which is a state of equilibrium between people, animals and environment. So we are going to show the video uh, now. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Marian Walid Abu Bakrin. I identify myself as Weltamasha, a Tuareg woman from Timbuktu in the Sahara and Sahel region. I'm joining you from the Algonquin and Anishinaabe ancestral territory in Ottawa, Canada. My people, the Keltamashak, used to practice nomadism as a way of life. We were driven by livestock through the land designated in Tamashak, my language, by Tinarwin. Due to the legacy of French colonization, the Tuareg land is split in five, split in five countries, making Tuareg people's minority in new countries known as Algeria, Burkina Faso, Libya, Mali, and Niger where my people's way of life is seen as not important and not contributing to these new countries' economies. To be included and benefiting from the basic services and human rights like health and education, we had to shift our way of life by stopping nomadism. Unfortunately, a decade after decolonization, the Sahel region was hit by a severe drought which had had consequences on the land, animals, and people. Then for the last 20 years, the same region is going through unprecedented chronic and complex as well as violence, violent conflict, mainly on the land inhabited by indigenous peoples. Today, I can classify Tuareg peoples in three groups. The first, Tuareg who are still practicing nomadism, they are in very few proportion. The second group, Tuareg forces to change their livelihood to practicing farm, farming and pastoralism or mixed. And the third group, Tuareg who lost any direct contact with the land in They live as displaced people, refugees, and they made slums of some big cities in the refugee camp. This situation and context is about my people the land I am nostalgic to and which I identify myself to. Unfortunately, when I listen to stories of indigenous sisters and brothers, I notice they are close to mine and Tinariwens. That's why it is important to come together as indigenous peoples, researchers, UN and other international organizations, states to put together our minds and efforts for sustainable and transformative solution to the challenges we face in protecting Mother Earth and for our survival and for a fire legacy for future generations. In that regard, there are three related initiatives I am involved in and I would like to introduce you. The first one is the Aramat Project, a team of indigenous organizations, governments, uh, universities, researchers, and other resource peoples who are working together for research and action in support the health and well being of the environment and people. We want to strengthen indigenous voices and capacities to document their knowledge about the importance of rural environment, including the biodiversity, to health and well being of their communities. The second initiative is the Global Hub on Indigenous Food Systems. Uh, the, this hub brings together indigenous and non-indigenous experts, uh, scientists and researchers to establish a knowledge dialogue 
that will gather evidence-based contributions on indigenous people's food systems. And they already released three publications, the Y Pala paper, the insight on in, in sustainability and resilience from the uh, front line of climate change. And the third publication is rethinking hierarchies of evidence for sustainable food systems. I invite you to learn more about these three publications on the FAO Indigenous Unit website. The third uh, initiative is the Coalition on Indigenous Food Systems. This coalition brings together indigenous leaders and organizations from the seven social cultural regions, representatives from the states, the scientific community, academia, and other allies to sustain, strengthen, and improve the food systems of indigenous peoples, as well as the impact and sustainability of effort to transform the world food system by ensuring that indigenous peoples are engaged as partners in the UN, uh, in the post UN food system summit processes. To conclude, let me emphasize on three key messages. First, mobilize indigenous knowledge to inform decision making related, for example, to environment, food security with the respect of their self determination, pre prior and informed concept consent and the intellectual property. Second, support and collaborate with existing initiatives by indigenous peoples to strengthen their leadership and their voices on issues affecting them, like the three I already mentioned. And third, three, join and support the work of the Coalition on Indigenous Food Systems, in particular for food security mitigation uh, of climate change in, for the context of Africa. Tanu Mer, thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you. I'm very happy that she were able to record this uh, presentation for us and to hear her perspectives on the issue at hand. And she also said that she looks forward to the outcome and next uh, steps that we will discuss later. And I encourage you to go and check her website. It's very inspiring and very beautiful. So it's uh, in the link. Uh, you find the link in the chat box. So our next speaker up is uh, Dr. Edmond Dunyas, who is also a core member of uh, the me of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food System. And the focus for his contribution to this webinar is uh, on the signals sent by the forests that are detected and interpreted, interpreted by indigenous people to anticipate changes in climate condition and to adjust their livelihoods accordingly. So welcome Edmond Dunyas, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Erika, for, for the introduction and for having uh, invited me to as panelists to this uh, to this webinar. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, compared to many ecosystems uh, of the planet, where the impact of climate change are extremely brutal and easy to measure. Uh, like melting ice sheets in the polar region, aridification in desert, um, receding glacier in high altitude mountains, coastal erosion, seawater uh, rising in ultramarine regions. Tropical rainforests seem to be less affected by climate change. They are in fact affected, but changes are slower, more subtle and even more insidious and certainly more difficult to measure. A dramatic consequence is that we may underestimate the risks as illustrated by the well-known boiling frog syndrome. If the frog jumps into a pot of boiled water, it will jump out immediately because it senses the danger. But if the pot contains cold water that is slowly brought to a boil, the frog will stay there because it does no longer sense the increasing danger. 
Fortunately, the, by contrast to many Westerners in rich countries, forest dependent peoples are poorly affected by the boiling frog syndrome because they know how to deal seriously with signs that clearly inform them that climate change is ongoing. To introduce this science, uh, let me tell you a nice story. The title of my story is, My daughter-in-law prepare me the meat of the African giant rating the paste of Egusi Melon. This apparently road remark is in fact a proverb of the Mvai farmers of Thousand Cameroon. The Mvai are renowned for their strong taste for using elliptic proverbs and engage into joyful battles of words. As I'm going to explain to you, this proverb is the equivalent of the English, everything is in odds time. Trapping the African giant right is a very seasonal activity. It is based on the mass fruiting of Ongokia gore, a Nolakase tree species, the fruit of which are highly appreciated by the giant rats. Normally, the phenology of Ongokia gore is annual and very regular. Fruiting season should occur in early September. The mass fruiting of Ongokia gore coincides with the good time for harvesting Egusi melon. It also announces the very beginning of the rainy season, a crucial event for these slash and burn farmers who absolutely need to finish burning the Sweden before the first uh, rains fall. The fruit serves also as a bait to trap the giant rats in great numbers. The rodent is one of the major pests ravaging the Egusi gardens. Bait traps are incorporated into the fence around the Egusi gardens and catch the rats that come to feed on the Egusi. This trap transforms the pest into a substantial source of meat. The field does not only provide crops, it, is also, it also provides bushmeat. This intense trapping occurs when the reproduction fitness of the giant rat is at its maximum, so the Mvai can temporarily mitigate the population of giant rats near the villages. Normally, the meat of the giant rat is not much appreciated, but it becomes a culturally valued meat when it is cooked in egusi paste. And it is a metaphoric sanction to the rat. The eater become the eat it. The cooking of egusi paste is a very long and sophisticated process that requires achieved know-how. Once the dish is ready, it has to be served and consumed immediately. Otherwise, it goes rancid and inedible in just a few hours. This dish is served at special festive events. In the proverb, a man is challenging his daughter-in-law to cook a negusi paste that is as tasty as the one prepared by his wife. During wedding negotiations, the future spouse has to demonstrate how good she is at cooking this emblematic dish and consequently prove her capacity to be a good housewife. Finally, this story shows the key role played by children who are the experts in capturing giant rats, thus contributing in preparing this emblematic dish and ensuring pest control. This little story around a proverb reveals the complexity of a food system spending on the connectivity between tradition, ecological knowledge, diet, and climate. Remove a single piece of the puzzle and the whole system will collapse. What if Ongokia gore trees do not fruit at the right time? No more rainy season announcement? No more coincidence with Egusi ripening? No more control of the giant rat paste? The new Sweden at the right moment? And no more tasty Egusi paste to serve at the wedding party? Ongokia gore is what I call a biotemporal indicator. It is a sign detected by local communities by the observation of the fruits of the surrounding environments. Signs are from different sources. They can be seen, heard, smelled, or touched. But a good sign rarely occurs in isolation. 
people use a beam of converging signals, a combination of determining events upon which they will organize the calendar or the activities and take their decisions. They can also be reinterpreted culturally as symbolic messages sent by the ancestors of supernatural forces. And this is why outsiders may mock these processes of decision-making or at best ignore them, although they are based on careful observation of natural facts. Insects are probably the most fascinating and the most accurate biotemporal signals because they are sensitive to very subtle fluctuations of climatic conditions at levels that are not directly perceptible by humans. Sting and stingless bees, for instance, are essential pollinators and natural ecosystem engineers, which are also known as precious sentinels of the environment. If something went wrong in the ecosystems, bees will tell you. The swarming of termite imagos, which are harvested by many African populations as a food delicacy, depends on very precise variations of the temperature, hygrometry, wind, uh, moonlight, etc. And they are also revealing of subtle alterations of climatic conditions. For instance, the Tika people of central Cameroon, who recognize 22 different species of termites and fondly eat half of them, decide of the calendar of the activities through the successive swarmings and the different termite species, the red dots, and the seasonal production of delicious mushrooms growing on the termite mounds, the green dots. In normal times, idealized by this blue curve, biotemporal indicators follow the cycle of seasons and announce the transitions between intra-annual seasons so that the forest dwellers could, can anticipate and adjust accordingly. Today, Forest dwellers are alerted by temporal signals that do not occur when they should, or that become erratic in amplitude or intensity. Some indicators that normally should occur simultaneously, like the red and green curves, are no longer um, um, now occur uh, asynchronically. Some changes are also noted from one year to another. Instead of having the same sequence of biotemporal signals repeated regularly, many, sever many severe interannual fluctuations are now observed by forest dwellers. And observed irregularities in biotemporal signals compromise the process of decision making which turns into individual arbitrar arbitrariness. This loss of consensual decision-making may cause misuses of forest resources and induce poverty trap. What is the capacity of forest dependent people to respond to the changes caused by climate? It is important here to assess the difference between the food resources that the people know about and the food resources that the people effectively used, use on a regular basis. The difference between these two spheres constitute a safety net for the food system. The larger the safety net, the greater the capacity of a community to adjust to its, its food system with regard to climate change. I would like to finish on this slide by saying that a major reason why we so much underestimate the impact of climate change on tropical rainforests is that rainforests are exposed to much more immediate threats of various origins and which are drama dramatic drivers of deforestation. I stop here and I thank you for all for your kind attention. Over to you, uh, Erika. Thank you very much, uh, Edmond Donias. This was very interesting and entertaining, a beautiful presentation uh, revealing the complexity of, uh, complexity of indigenous people food system 
And uh, also, um, I think it was a very good illustration, uh, the bowling frog syndrome that uh, perhaps not everyone has seen and it uh, may be easy for people to remember this concept. And uh, also, thank you for introducing us to how great of a resource forest is and also the traditional knowledge and expertise that uh, uh, indigenous people have when it comes to protecting the forest and take use of uh, the forest in the best uh, way for current generations and future generations to come. So our next speaker up is um, Ellen Henrike Ålerud, who is the senior advisor at NORAD. Her contribution to this webinar will be to expand upon how Norway supports indigenous people and local communities in the Congo Basin through Central African Forest Initiative and through funding to civil society. So Ellen Henrike, I welcome you to the screen. Thank you very much um, for being invited. Thank you to the Norwegian Council uh, for Africa for having this webinar. And I would also like first to, to thank uh, the speakers before me for very interesting um, presentations. Uh, I will um, uh, I have been asked to do you see my I see your presentation uh, yes yeah you see the big presentation now yeah yeah so I have been asked uh, to to talk a bit about the institutional setup and challenges and um, uh, I work in NORAD uh, and uh, uh, I'm responsible uh, for uh, the Central African Forest Initiative in NORAD. Uh, and I work in close collaboration with NICFI and, um, uh, and others. Um, I think I would, even though mentioned by several of the other speakers, I think I would like to start with uh, um, looking at the challenge in the Congo Basin. Uh, and uh, uh, more specifically at the drivers of deforestation. There is uh, a lack of um, information uh, about uh, uh, many things in, in the Congo Basin. Uh, for instance, uh, there is still uh, even a lack of good information about um, all the people uh, living there. But this study by uh, Kavina et al uh, from 2018 uh, points to the drivers of deforestation and uh, demonstrate that 85% uh, of the first disturbance in the Congo Basin is actually because of non-mechanical um, uh, small-scale agriculture. Uh, in this presentation, you also see uh, the different uh, cookies, the cakes and the size, and you see that most of the deforestation uh, is taking part in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, while you also have important deforestation in the other countries. The drivers are also uh, diverse in DRC and in uh, the Central African Republic, more than 90% of the deforestation is due to, or forest disturbance, is due to small scale non-mechanical agriculture. In other countries, uh, you see that the, the pink is uh, industrial selective logging. It's more important in Gabon in the Republic of Congo uh, and also in Cameroon. Mm. Uh, you also see that um, large scale uh, agriculture is more important in countries like Cameroon. Uh, however, there are still some discussions about the drivers of deforestation and um, a more recent study uh, by Molinario in 2020 
points out that uh, deforestation in uh, the democrat uh, in DRC uh, is, is also uh, being found uh, five kilometers from uh, mining, logging, and plantations. Uh, they point out that 10% of expansion of the rural complex happens close to, to mining, logging, and plantation. So uh, there are a different uh, set of underlying factors. Um, so even though uh, small-scale agriculture is the cause, you have uh, infrastructure development, population growth, uh, lack of right to land, uh, lack of land use planning, poverty, weak governance, etc. So um, how, how do we work uh, from, from Norway to, to address these challenges? Uh, Nuran, uh, together, or we managed the funds from the um, Norwegian Climate and Forest Initiative. And uh, uh, Nurad is responsible for the climate and forest funding to civil society. And we also manage other strategic support. Uh, it was a call for proposal uh, last year for the 2021 to 2025 period. Uh, where uh, 11 civil society organizations uh, was selected, uh, which has uh, activities in the Congo Basin. And among these, it's also organizations supporting um, indigenous peoples, local communities, uh, and uh, environmental defenders. Uh, NURAD supports, for example, Rainforest Foundation, Rainforest Foundation, uh, UK and Rainforest Foundation Norway and uh, Caritas Norway, who works directly uh, with um, local communities and also doing um, advocacy work as uh, well presented by Filana. And we also have uh, working through the Central African First Initiative that I will elaborate a bit more on uh, in the in the rest of this presentation. Um, so what is uh, the Central African First Initiative? It is a coalition of donors, uh, of like-minded donors, uh, working together with six partner countries in the Congo Basin, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Cameroon, the Republic of Congo, Republic of Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea and the Republic of Gabon. Mm, and uh, we also collaborate with implementing UN organizations. This collaboration was formalized in 2015 through the CAFI declaration. And uh, CAFI is at one hand, a political platform uh, that uh, negotiate um, um, and dialogue at the highest level with the governments in the Congo Basin countries. And we also uh, have a trust fund uh, that supports direct investments on the ground. So how does CAFI work? Um, the countries, uh, uh, based on national forest and climate strategies, based on other national um, development framework, uh, national uh, climate um, goals, etc., uh, develop national investment frameworks. Uh, these being endorsed by uh, the executive board of um, of coffee uh, are being um, uh, subject to negotiations of uh, letter of intents. 
this letter of intents uh, are signed uh, at the highest level of government. Um, Kafi has, by today, uh, signed letter of intents with Gabon, with uh, the Republic of Congo. And we have signed a second letter of intent with uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in Glasgow. Um, the latest one was signed by uh, President Chisikedi and Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Mm, the letter of intents have principle, they have concrete, uh, time, bind, time, bound, time bound milestones, and um, they include reforms and programmatic performance. Kafi also support policy development and participation. And uh, we have uh, uh, a continuous high level dialogue with partner countries also at the highest level. So, um, where do we invest? Given that um, the causes of deforestation uh, and the underlying causes are diverse. CAFI invests in uh, eight uh, strategic sectorial pillars in agriculture. As I showed you, uh, a large share of um, deforestation is caused by small scale agriculture. And it's important to uh, make sure that people are better off uh, to preserve uh, the forests. No one can um, come out um, worse. So poverty is, is important and agriculture is the main occupation by the majority of the population. So this is a very important uh, activity. Then it's energy. Um, approximately 10% of deforestation is caused by uh, the use of uh, fuel, wood, and charcoal for food, uh, for cooking. It's first governance and monitoring, um, land use planning, land tenure policy, land tenure work, uh, demography, uh, and governance. And then I will come back to the um, to the. Uh, how we work uh, with indigenous uh, peoples and local communities. Um, and uh, we work systematically in, in, uh, in CAFE, in uh, including, uh, for example, principles uh, in the letter of intents. Uh, I would like to, um, to use as an example the, the letter of intent uh, with DRC, where in the um, in, in the preamble is introduced uh, a reference to the speech made by uh, President Chisikedi on the occasion of the International Day of Indigenous Peoples, 8th of August 2020, where the president, among other things, referred to securing lands and assess ancestral territories of indigenous pygmies in large natural reserves, ecological and community-based as per their will and under their control. Then uh, also in the time bound milestones, um, concrete measures are included, um, for example, also in the letter of intent with DRC signed in Glasgow, it is included uh, that a total of at least 5 million hectares of local community forest concessions are granted. And it's also a conservation measure. Uh, by 2030, the goal of at least 30% of national areas 
under the protection status will have been achieved. But uh, there is, of course, um, some uh, fear around uh, protection because uh, of the history that has been mentioned today. But it is important here that it included including areas dedicated by local communities themselves to first protection. And the free prior and informed consent is of course part of, of this milestone. Then uh, there are also others. Uh, we can share the LOI with you if you're interested. And then it's concrete programs because it's also important to make sure that civil society and indigenous peoples can participate in um, decision-making processes and in reforms. Uh, in DRC, Kafi uh, through Ponared um, has, uh, for example, supported uh, a project to strengthen indigenous people's capacities to participate uh, in the different uh, reforms. Also mentioned by um, by um, here today, uh, the the land, the land use planning reform, the land tenure reform, uh, and the, the agricultural reform and development of forest policies. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And it's also supported a, a program to have the participation of the civil society more in general in all uh, program activities at national and provincial level. And then I would also like to, to uh, highlight that in the national um, governance bodies, uh, we also make sure that civil society are present. For example, in the National Red Fund um, in DRC, you have civil society at all uh, governance uh, bodies uh, of the fund. And uh, so uh, I will uh, admit that there are challenges to, to having uh, a good participation and to, to make the policies uh, inclusive. And um, therefore we also um, depend on organizations like Rainforest Foundation Norway and other organizations to, to, to partner up and to support the government um, so we can together uh, reduce uh, deforestation and protect the livelihoods of uh, indigenous people and local communities. And uh, that's uh, what I had for now. And uh, I look forward to questions and uh, uh, and the discussions that will come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen Henrika. Uh, this was also a very important uh, presentation for the for the panel dialogue um, webinar. And I want to say that um, uh, it was very insightful to see the underlying drivers, such as mining, logging, lack of land use planning, and weak governance as also drivers of deforestation in the Congo Basin. Uh, and it's also good to see how you support Congo Basin through the Central African Forest Initiative, and to hear that you work with projects that include the indigenous people in the decision-making processes, but also say that it's, a, it's also a challenge to ensure that uh, uh, we include uh, all aspects of uh, indigenous people's uh, um, decisions when it comes to these decision-making processes. I will now welcome uh, Emmanuel Magnoli, uh, who is going to moderate the panel dialogue. And uh, he will introduce Falana to take the, first, uh, take the first presentation. So welcome, uh, Emmanuel. I will leave the screen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear panelists, for a very interesting discussion so far. 
uh, we are very happy and uh, to hear all these insightful uh, discussions and also especially the, the mention of uh, Edmond about the uh, egusi, which is uh, my favorite food. <laughs> back over there in Cameroon. So I just um, have a panel discussion and then uh, we have on the floor back uh, Felania. So yeah, we listened to your first discussion, presentation, very interesting um, um, presentation. So we just want to have some uh, follow-up uh, discussion with you concerning power and uh, cultural identity of the people. This is all within the auspices of how the Democratic Republic of Congo could uh, become uh, a model for, for, for climate and, and biodiversity. So how, how do you see the DRC as, uh, as, as a model for uh, climate and biodiversity? Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, as, uh, as it, is, uh, it was said, through all the presentation today, uh, for DRC to become this model, uh, securing indigenous uh, people's land and their resource rights uh, would not only allow these peoples to carry on uh, playing their role as guardians of the rainforest, uh, but it also contributes to, uh, to, to, to set foundation for their uh, sustainable development, according to their uh, traditional knowledge, cultures, and uh, uh, aspiration. Thus, the country will also, we know that the sustainable development depends on the preservation of rainforest and biodiversity. So therefore, by preserving the country's rainforest based on securing indigenous peoples and community land uh, rights, uh, the DRC would also set uh, the sustainable development for the whole country. But this needs uh, condition, this needs also um, to address different points. Uh, so the first would be that um, how, <clears throat> as, um, as Elan said before, there is this commitment uh, from uh, the President Chisekedi uh, to secure uh, high peace, uh, the indigenous people's land, but how concretely can we do it? Uh, how would Norway uh, or um, uh, CAFE support the DRC in uh, realizing this commitment at uh, local, at every level, local, provincial, and national level. Um, another point that should be highlighted also is that uh, at RFN, uh, we are um, trying to create a kind of integrated mosaic and of indigenous and community land and protected areas. Uh, we have initiative called Forest for Life uh, with other partners, uh, international uh, organization partners. So this also needs uh, some contribution. And um, uh, we, we also need, for example, CAFE to, uh, to contribute to such in initiative. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 the CAFE funds or the program or international program that is a set up in DRC uh, should see this as an opportunity also to, um, to help DRC to become this model for climate and biodiversity fund. Another point, uh, important point, as I've said, is that how can we support the implementation also of the indigenous people's law that should be, um, we hope, uh, uh, definitely adopted uh, this year or next year, and also prioritize and uh, scale up uh, the funding for uh, IPLC tenure and forest management. So maybe I can stop there. Yeah, just to follow up with um, your, your, your presentation on um, empowering the indigenous people and of course the DRC being a model. I must say that uh, you guys at the Rainforest Foundation are doing an enormous job in trying to empower the, the indigenous people in, uh, in the DRC. So I encourage you to continue, but I just have some reflections, especially when you talk about 
the representation at the national level? Do you have, for instance, um, um, indigenous people from the Baka tribe, uh, the Pygmies, who are um, parliamentarians, who are also involved themselves as parliamentarians, as leaders, making these decisions, uh, these forest decisions? Do you have that in Congo, or do you think of uh, pushing the, the government to also include them as parliamentarians in making these decisions? Yes, uh, there are not much uh, uh, indigenous people parliamentarian for the moment, but uh, uh, indigenous people law include dispositions that uh, will facilitate uh, the integration of indigenous people in uh, public uh, services or public policies or institutions. So this will also help to uh, the indigenous people law also will also help in this uh, area. Okay, yeah. So the, just the last question and then we would come back again. Uh, do you have these uh, Pygmy languages uh, taught in schools, used in the public places, just for the purpose of integration? Um, not specifically for the moment, but also yeah. indigenous people know have this position to get, uh, to give Indigenous people education according to their traditional language or according to their cultures. So uh, this is why this uh, law is also important for them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Felania. Yeah. So we will just go now to the input and the discussion phase. Uh, we don't have enough time. So um, I think uh, maybe we'll just call to the floor all the panelists. So I have a question for uh, Mr. Leaf. Uh, he, he made a very interesting discussion about uh, um, strategies that uh, Nick Fee is involved in trying to see how they can uh, um, coordinate activities to try to stop deforestation. And amongst these are financial markets, forest crimes, transparency activities, and all these things. I just I just wonder, is this, is this something that you think about? Do you think about, for instance, working with banks to, to trace the, 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 the income, this illegal, this illicit income that is generated from uh, uh, um, um, forest activities? You know, because one of the ways to stop deforestation is actually to make deforestation not profitable to, um, to, 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 to those practicing these activities. And that simply means that they should be poor. Yeah, they should be poor. They should not be, uh, uh, this uh, activity should not make them rich. So do you work with banks? Because I didn't actually see that in, the, in, your, in, your, in your strategies. So I don't know if it's something you're, you're working with. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very interesting questions. And I think, uh, and I'm trying to see my presentation as well as uh, keep track of you in the picture here. Uh, now, if you see, if you see on the screen now, uh, the seven strategies, I tried to share the screen. Uh, are you seeing it? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Good. <clears throat> So as I said, uh, our strategies are divided between, you know, what the tropical forest countries can do themselves, you know, to get their land use policies right, to allow land tenure for indigenous peoples and uh, local communities, to make sure that uh, their, their areas are well protected from incursions or private sector uh, intrusions, um, and uh, for, you know, private investments uh, to, to respect the indigenous people's land rights and so on. Uh, that's one important area. Uh, when we work with carbon markets, as you see, uh, we, are, we make sure that, you know, on the one hand, we have to make sure that tropical forest governments have, you know, received funding for, um, for protecting forest and for, to, uh, as an alternative to turn them into commodities. Uh, so when we set up that sort of international markets, we have to make sure that the risks uh, are reduced as much as possible by way of safeguards, uh, which have been a big topic in uh, the uh, reduced emissions, uh, the RED uh, framework. 
Uh, uh, as part of that, we also address how uh, finance goes into destructive activities, uh, because you know pr private uh, actors, companies, they get the funding required to turn forests into commodities or into timber plantations, that money comes from, from somewhere, uh, from capital markets. So increasingly over the last few years, we are also working with the, those capital markets. Uh, and we also learn and cooperate closely with uh, companies like Sturebrand, which is a bit of a pioneer in this area, uh, which has socially and environmentally um, good uh, principles for their investments uh, and they are much like the Norwegian uh, no pension fund they are quite um, they are quite wary uh, about companies which they should not support by their investments because they have a history of uh, uh, violating human rights or uh, or being involved in forest cracks so making private finance more aware of the risks associated with unscrupulous financing is an important topic for us, in addition to these other strategies. And, you know, these strategies support each other. So, for instance, when there is more transparency, when there is uh, satellite technologies available to everyone for free, that may enables civil society to track where deforestation happens, who is behind it, uh, and uh, who they should lobby to make sure it stops. And also to, to hold their governments accountable so that governments will no, no longer be able to say, but we didn't know where it happened or how it happened, uh, because these data will now enable uh, the governments themselves to know what's going on in their forests, to know whether the companies are uh, deforesting uh, where they shouldn't be, where they are not allowed to, and whether they are uh, in doing incursions into protected areas or indigenous territories and so on. So this, we make sure that there is commitments among the private finance companies. Uh, there is technological support for everyone that wants to hold them accountable. And we try to help countries enforce uh, their own forest laws so that we suppress forest crime as much as possible. So governance, which basically sums up all of these strategies, uh, in the case of the Democratic Republic of Congo, for instance, uh, just having the state capture more of the finance that is actually in the country. Uh, I mean, not just getting into national finance, but actually having a tax base, having people pay tax, having the people who can afford it pay tax, just realizing that sort of potential would be, you know, already uh, go a far, go a long way into helping uh, the country realize some of its needs, uh, you know, financially, as well as socially and environmentally. But because as it is now, the, the, the government is hardly in control of its territory. That's probably why you have these wars in Eastern Congo. Uh, and uh, much of the commercial activity that is going on uh, doesn't really lead to uh, development for the country. It, it, whether, it, whether it's cobalt mining, uh, logging, um, you know, other privately, commercially profitable activities, which are not used to build the country. So yes, we try to make sure that these various strategies support each other and uh, are helping the private sector uh, or any more specifically, the capital markets be conscious that this is actually in their interest to be transparent and to support the right activities and to stop uh, supporting the uh, illegal activities that all of this is in their interests uh, to not be on the morally or economically uh, wrong side of the fence. Because obviously some of these activities will be stranded assets. If, uh, you know, when we uh, have to uh, put all uh, our efforts into uh, controlling climate change, that means some of these uh, investments will be stranded assets if, if they don't take action now. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Just uh, one really small follow-up question to that. Could you also uh, consider, for instance, a ban on um, um, products such as palm nuts from uh, Africa into Norway or in the EU? Because this uh, uh, cultivation of palm nuts in, uh, in, in, in Africa, these are the things that fund uh, a deforestation. Could you consider ban of some products? This has been done, uh, the EU attempted to do that in 2015 and, uh, and things like that. So could you see that as a possible strategy, a strong strategy, like Norway putting a ban on this product? No. Um... The, the, the principles underlying uh, international trade is that a country that is legally produced uh, in its own country, uh, you know, no one else has an opportunity to actually ban that. So that's the, that's basically the way that the international trade system, which a lot of countries, uh, you know, base their economies on, um, that if something is legal, is that, you know, it, it is not up to individual countries to ban products that are legal in the country of origin. Uh, what you can do, which the EU is doing now, is that to say that some products are uh, associated with risk of deforestation and forest degradation and to work out some internationally accepted rules for what those commodities are, uh, what the risks involved are, and to say that for our own part, we will limit uh, products, which we, according to these criteria, uh, consider to be risky. Uh, they will not be able to uh, be on the European market unless uh, they can document that, that the producing countries can document they have been produced legally and sustainably. So, Bans are very difficult to get at, but uh, applying clear rules, which importing countries as well as exporting countries can uh, re relate to, uh, that is probably a better way forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next uh, input is uh, for Nurat, Ellen. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion, Ellen. Uh, I was just wondering um, when I looked at your presentation uh, regarding the priority areas, I saw that agriculture is a major priority for the CAFI funding. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So does it involve, for instance, uh, subsidizing imports, for example, import of maize? from uh, uh, Brazil so that uh, local farmers don't have the urge to produce maize uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Congo, for instance, because uh, cultivating this maize require the use of land, forest land and things like that. So what does this uh, 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 agriculture, how do you use, uh, how do you support agriculture in a way that uh, discourages uh, a deforestation? What are the activities that you do? Um, well, we have several activities uh, and it depends also on the different type of agriculture because you have uh, in some countries and also the risk, uh, as you see in, in other continents, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, a lot of the deforestation uh, happens because of large scale uh, agricultural production. Uh, so, so that is one, one risk. Uh, but at the other side, it is important for the countries to uh, be independent and to uh, um, be um, to increase their agricultural production, to be able to uh, um, feed their population uh, and also to have uh, an economy that is less dependent on imports. Uh, so uh, how do we support this? Uh, first of all, in the negotiations with the countries, um, it's important where the agricultural and industrial agricultural agriculture uh, will take place. So uh, we negotiate that uh, commercial agriculture will not take place in forest areas. 
um, together with the countries uh, in a participatory process where also civil society and indigenous peoples are invited to take part. We will define a high value forest, uh, for example, in DRC or forest with high carbon value, high um, uh, conservation value. These forests uh, will not uh, be uh, cut for agricultural purposes. Uh, uh, industrial agriculture will um, be uh, supported in savannas and in areas uh, with less uh, harm on forest and biodiversity. Oh. So, so that is very important. It's an important principle to increase production, to increase uh, the possibility of the countries to have a, a, a good agricultural sector. Uh, but it should take place in areas where it doesn't harm the forest um, and biodiversity. At the other side, uh, the entire population uh, depends on agricultural activities for their livelihood. And it's important yeah. that their livelihood um, doesn't, uh, aren't harmed by uh, the activities to reduce deforestation. So uh, first of all, uh, with, with people, first uh, dependent communities, uh, we, we have a, an approach where we um, do participatory land use planning to identify uh, areas suitable for agriculture and areas suitable for forest preservation. And then uh, we also work through different implementing organizations on techniques and on way to increase the efficiency through uh, improved seeds, uh, improved techniques, uh, better access to market and uh, other ways of making the production more efficient. So uh, we will try to have a win-win situation where uh, the production and the income of the families increase uh, at the same time as they um, uh, reduce deforestation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. It's uh, uh, controlling deforestation is very complex because any uh, move you make to fix the situation actually can also contribute to spoiling spoiling the situation. But uh, I, I just in in your in your um, key priority areas that you talk and your relationship with the the civil society in this uh, in these regions, do you also consider like uh, working with uh, developing the transport sector because that is where that is the. Uh, it, Big, incent big incentives or driver to deforestation in the sense that a good transport system allows these products to be transported from farm um, to the market. So do you see empowering the private sector? Do you try to look at, for instance, how uh, transportation can be more secured? Uh, 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 do you encourage these uh, partner countries to, to reinforce their transport system to ensure that they know exactly what goods are, are transported and things like that. Does uh, transportation cut across uh, your mind in the in the in the, in the uh, cafe uh, scheme? No, uh, infrastructure and transport uh, are very badly developed in, in the Central African region, and uh, it's very important to have uh, good um, transport systems to have access to market, etc. Um, and that being said, yes, it is uh, a risk of deforestation uh, when you have also a good transport system. So mm. it, it needs to be, uh, so developing uh, infrastructure is important and uh, it's, it's different, um, uh, different issues. One issue is to actually improve a existing infrastructure uh, uh, to make access uh, to, to where people live uh, better. Um, and another issue is to actually open up new infrastructure. And, uh, uh, and here also comes the, the issue of where it will happen and how it will happen. So we support uh, land use uh, planning reforms. It's very important that land use planning reforms um, provides um, 
uh, measures on how to uh, support transportation, etc., in, in in a way that it doesn't increase deforestation. Yeah, uh, and we have the issue again of high forest, uh, high value forest, and then um, high biodiversity value. So uh, this should be taken into consideration when you also consider transportation. Um, so uh, yes, it is important, but it needs to be uh, done in a way that is uh, reducing the risk of increased deforestation. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. We are running late, but I have a question for uh, Edmond, one simple question. So uh, we can move to the next part of uh, uh, the discussion. Uh, uh, Edmond, you, your, your presentation, uh, can, can we see Edmond? Your presentation cuts across, um, brings a connection between biodiversity and, and nutrition. And you touched me particularly when you presented your, 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 your presentation on igusi, which is one of my favorite uh, a, a dish over there in Cameroon. I just want to find out um, how is the population accepting this food strategy, which is very important in, in biodiversity conservation. In this in this local area, because one of the re, one of the problems that we usually have is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the community not accepting uh, food which, when consumed or utilized, are uh, very safe for uh, 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 about diversity conservation, such as a, a, a goosey, because if more people accept it, more people cultivate it, then it's good for the environment. I'm not sure if you're getting it. Hello? I think we can just move to the next part then. Is that okay? Yes, perhaps you can uh, save the questions for to him yeah, for the, the Q&A. Yeah. Yeah, so we can just handle the Q&A together, right? Yes, that we can do. Yeah, we also have um, questions from, uh, yeah. We have questions from uh, uh, the panel as well and from the audience. Uh, the first is, uh, Several of the ecosystems we talk about are split between countries and borders. How are uh, initiatives affected by these in terms of uh, different governance systems, cooperation with donor countries, etc.? Is this an issue in the Congo Basin? That's uh, a question from the from the audience. Is uh, anyone available to answer them? Yeah, maybe we move to the next question. Uh, traditional indigenous knowledges and the integrated as is is this integrated as value knowledge in the education system? This is also from uh, a member in the in the audience. Anyone has any idea on that? I think Edmund's presentation was very valuable in that regard to show uh, how the knowledge that uh, indigenous peoples, uh, such as the Tua in the uh, Congo Basin, how they use that knowledge built over centuries and, and millennia to read their environment, to understand what's going on, um, while, you know, uh, doing everyday activities to control pests, to bring food on the table. I think that was a fascinating story, and uh, mm. it goes to prove how, in uh, uh, traditional knowledge, um, you know, goes the significance of that traditional knowledge goes far beyond 
uh, you know, just what the people need to survive. Uh, it can actually inform science at the highest level. Uh, and uh, that is indeed happening. Uh, at the Food System Summit, uh, traditional knowledge and food system was acknowledged in the uh, International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, traditional knowledge from indigenous peoples is re recognized as part of the science basis for, for the reports on what goes on with our climate. And the same happens for nature and biodiversity. So slowly, slowly, and uh, admittedly much too late, um, this sort of knowledge is being recognized also as part of science. So, um, um, but obviously um, this is not always true in the countries where the indigenous peoples uh, find themselves. Uh, in and this goes to respond to the first question as well. You know, uh, these are countries with quite arbitrarily drawn borders in some cases as a result of the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. So, you know, while the governments are trying to build a nation out of these more or less haphazard borders, uh, indigenous peoples often find that their priorities, their worldviews, their outlook is disregarded. Uh, in the uh, the government's drive to build a nation out of many disparate and uh, different ethnicities, uh, which is obviously what they have to do as a government, and uh, it's a worthwhile effort. But uh, it is important not to lose the special contributions and the tr traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities in that process. Yeah, I think it's yeah. You, you have more to say? <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's, I'm very interested in, in, in the uh, furthering of uh, local ecological knowledge, but the problem we usually have is uh, people argue that it has not been tested, so probably it cannot be used and things like that, but we, it can help a lot in, in, in advancing policy making. So I'm very glad that it is, uh, uh, an issue that is, is, is looked at. Uh, uh, Ellen, I think you, are, you have a, uh, an observation to make. I saw your hand up. No, no, thank you. I was just reading the questions and uh, it was a sp uh, specific questions to, to Life Yun and, and me from, um, from Halna Mollan. Okay, you, you want to answer them? Uh, yeah, but actually if it's still time, I would like to answer. Yeah, we have 13 minutes, so. Maybe you can just uh, use a few to answer them and then maybe we'll rush over one or two more. Okay, no, uh, thank you um, for, the, for the question. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, is uh, about, um, well, yeah. Uh, Do you want me to, I can ask, introduce you to the question. Um, we had a question from the audience. Uh, asking how can organizations like Rainforest Foundation Norway better incorporate governance failure as a driver of deforestation in our, in our programming? Granted, it's a long-term process to improve governance. Still, are we, the Rainforest Foundation, too focused on the commercial drivers and not enough on governance failure and non-mechanical agriculture as drivers of deforestation and forest disturbance? That was the question to Leif uh, Jun and Alan from Hanna Mulan. Would you, would you like to answer that, Alan Henrike? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think I would like to, um, to take part uh, or to follow up on the um, question on, uh, on um, deforestation from um, non-mechanical uh, agriculture. I think that um, commercial drivers are important, and I think it's important to have a focus on them. Uh, maybe they're not so important, for example, in DRC today, but it's still a threat if you look at experience from other countries. And, and also other countries in the region have more deforestation from um, commercial drivers. But that being said, uh, I think it's important. Uh, I think we are in an important phase now where indigenous peoples and uh, local communities are getting more uh, attention and uh, uh, they're also lifted uh, by by government by different stakeholders and um, uh, as Leifjön uh, showed in his introduction 
it's a study that showed that indigenous uh, people's land in Africa uh, are less deforested. Uh, and um, in DRC, uh, we have a process now uh, where, um, uh, where um, the, um, um, the community forests uh, are being uh, supported and set up, etc. But after giving the rights, it's important also to, to look at the livelihood options and to actually being able to uh, support the communities uh, with livelihood options that doesn't uh, contribute to increased deforestation. And uh, I think it is important to, to actually uh, show uh, actions and, and show results in the next two or three years to, to continue to have uh, the support um, fr from the from the broader society to to continue to to have um, uh, to, to have a focus on community forests. So uh, I think that there is a room to think together uh, what kind of activities that can actually be. Uh, implemented that support uh, communities and to increase their livelihoods uh, in a way that doesn't um, increase deforestation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. One uh, um, um, very important aspect that has been left out in our discussion and probably uh, live, uh, you, Elena, and the Felania can uh, respond to before we go to the closing remarks and, and things like that is the role of the media. The role of the media in 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 all of this. Uh, it is very important that the, uh, the 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 communities know exactly what the impacts, the drivers, and the 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 plan of uh, 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 rainforest management strategy is. And the role of the media is very important in 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 accelerating this information to the people. So this cafe sponsoring and the empowerment does it also involve the the role of the media to empower the media to 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 discuss these issues without fear or favor? What's your experience in in uh, in, in Congo, uh, Elenia? And uh, Elenia, you can uh, you can anybody can just put in a comment if you if you will about the role of the media in in all of this. Okay, um, uh, uh, you are uh, really right, Emmanuel, because uh, media is the channel, uh, you know, to educate, to inform, to sensitize. Uh, um, but and, and if I may say, unfortunately, uh, this is not yet um, used in this way. Uh, media is not yet used in this way, and uh, uh, it needs to be. Um, this needs to uh, to be um, an action uh, in our part, in the civil society part, uh, even with with the donors part, to uh, you know um, push the media to talk much more about about it and to talk talk much more uh, to take part of also not just inform but they have to take part also in this, this discussion and uh, give their position and uh, and in such way. So I think that um, in my experience, in our experience, this what you have uh, said is uh, very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, anybody li uh, live, Elena? You want to add on? on uh, okay, all right. So just. Uh, Thank you guys for a wonderful presentation, discussion. <laughs> uh, we don't have enough time, but uh, we are very appreciative of your time and effort. Uh, our organization, the Norwegian Climate uh, Committee, is uh, very interested in working with these issues. And we are going to produce our report, which is going to come out very soon. It will carry strategies, a lot of strategies that can be used to uh, make the process of CAFI and all this effort to fight against uh, deforestation in Africa work. We have a lot of experience working on these issues and we are very open for partnership in terms of uh, exposing 
the, the ideals of deforestation and how to make it work in terms of empowering the private sector. So uh, we're open for collaboration. If you, if you have projects you want to work with, and things like that. We are already working on a project with Felania concerning this uh, this report that is going to be very available for everyone to see. So see us as a, a support system just to make this process all work. So now this is just time for remarks. If you have any remarks and, and, and anything to say, this is the time for you to do that. We have just uh, five minutes. Yeah. Are you referring to me? <laughs> Am yeah, I you, anyone. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was a yeah. Bit unsure. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone, uh, the guest speakers, uh, for your valuable contribution to this webinar, and thank you to the audience who found time and interest to join us this Thursday evening. Uh, we have seen and heard clearly today from the presentation by Daifion Fossa, Felena Rokotobo, and Edmond Donias how indigenous people are key guardians of the forest and know their lands and forests better than anyone, and nothing can replace their knowledge and experience uh, when it comes to protecting and taking care of the forest for uh, generations today and for generations to come. Um, the forest, in addition to being a source of land, uh, a source of food, of water, uh, culture and livelihood and well-being, uh, Edmund Dunias presented to us very inter interestingly how the forest is valuable, uh, a valuable resource where signals sent by the forest can be interpreted by forest owners to anticipate global changes such as climate change. And, and, and by then, by these measures and interpretations, they can adjust their livelihoods accordingly. So the forest is a resource whose people lives depend on. And deforestation is a form of action that comes with, uh, will come with big regrets and consequences for the future generation. Uh, so I want to end it with saying that we all live in a strongly interconnected world where actions or the lack of actions taken in one country can have a positive or negative impact and effects uh, far, far away. And we can either support or infringe on people's human rights, if you say very, uh, it's a complex issue, but uh, it's, um, it's a way of saying that we can all do something uh, to support uh, indigenous people and local communities abroad, and that uh, all uh, actions or small or big steps have a, can have a positive or negative impact on their livelihoods. And uh, climate changes today and overall environmental degradation is to a high degree driven by man-made forces from higher income countries. And we must take accountability of these actions and use the resources we have uh, and from both from the, the our own resources, but also uh, combined with traditional knowledge to combat deforestation and land degradation for the health of the planet and the health of the people. So we saw that NORAD and NIFSI uh, works to get together with um, support civil society organizations and try to uh, include indigenous people in the big decision making processes. So um, thank you today. Um, the webinar uh, is uh, closed. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye all. Very useful. Thank you. Mm.